folks. My name is Mark Crandall, and I handle global regulatory compliance with Google Cloud. A little bit of background, uh, I'm a lawyer by training. I'm part of uh, Google Cloud Engineering to help ensure that the products we provide to customers meet uh, their regulatory compliance needs as best we can. Uh, we focus on three areas. The first thing is working with the sales organization as well as uh, our legal teams to find out what the latest trends are from a compliance perspective and what the market needs. We work with engineering and product management to drive change within the organization to help address those needs. And finally, we work with regulatory authorities to help learn what the trends are from regulators and also get their input when it comes to building our services. I've been at Google 12 years and was, uh, and as a lawyer, helped launch uh, one of Google Cloud's first product offerings, G Suite, in 2006. So let's move forward. So the thing we want to talk about is how can we manage regulatory risk? And when I talk about managing regulatory risk, many folks operate in regulated markets. Uh, you might operate in the healthcare field, or in government, or in financial services, or education. Or you might uh, have privacy considerations, such as the recently, uh, the recently uh, um, implemented General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which took effect in May. So a lot of folks have regulatory compliance considerations. So the question is how to mitigate that risk. Now, um, your counsel and your compliance experts are the folks you want to look at, but we also have experience in cloud at Google, and we'd like to share some of our experiences. So we're going to talk about four areas today. We're going to talk about the importance of conducting a compliance assessment within your own organization, your own vertical. We're going to talk about the importance of transparency about the services we provide, uh, the importance of contracts and making sure things are in writing to demonstrate that to your regulators. And then, time permitting, we're going to talk about some regulatory frameworks that have been important we've seen in the last uh, few years in our work in the cloud. So let's focus first on compliance assessments. So Google operates in virtually every country, uh, not every country, but almost. Um, and let's think about all the ver industry verticals per country, like healthcare, education, government, manufacturing. There's potentially millions of regulatory compliance combinations worldwide. At Google, we are not the expert in every single compliance framework combination that's possible. Our customers in their industry are the experts in their specific field. You have your counsel, you have your compliance experts, your chief privacy officers, your compliance officers, your security officers. So you should leverage what you know regarding your specific field. And by the way, um, your counsel really can help you there. What we're saying here is not legal advice. You have your own lawyers. However, we at Google are experts in the cloud and we are also experts in having provided cloud services to many customers who are regulated. So we have a lot of experience in that regard, so you can partner with us. The work and the leverage that we have in the industry with regards to helping people, our experience, our capabilities. And the point then is that this is a shared responsibility. You have your compliance obligations, you have your compliance expertise, we have expertise in the cloud, and the idea is that we provide you with the transparency you need to be able to conduct a meaningful risk assessment based on the services we provide. So when I talk about meaningful risk assessment, the key here is to think like a regulator. In all the years that we've been doing this with regards to Google Cloud, there's one thing that's, uh, that's been a common denominator across all regulated fields that we've seen. And that common denominator is that regulators expect, they expect that you conduct your due diligence before you adopt a cloud provider. It doesn't matter if it's the privacy sector in Europe or healthcare in the United States or, or, or financial services in the Asia Pacific region. That's what we've seen. Regulatory authorities expect that you conduct that due diligence. So look at some of these areas. They expect you to know the answers to these questions before you adopt cloud. For example, what are the security capabilities of the cloud provider? Um, obviously, you're going to be seeing a lot of presentations this week about our capabilities from a security perspective, but you need to be, answer, be able to answer these questions. Who owns the data? When you upload your data to Google Cloud, our position is that any data you upload into the cloud remains yours. It's your data. But again, regulators expect you to know that answer. Um, how is data being used? 
Google Cloud's position is that any data that you provide to us will only be processed according to your instructions to provide the services and to protect that data. And the reason why how the data is being used is so important is because there are many sectors, particularly education or privacy or healthcare, where data cannot be used for any other purpose than what is otherwise required or prescribed by those regulators. So educational information can't be used for any other purpose than for educational purposes. Or in HIPAA, for example, PHI, which we'll talk about, um, healthcare information can't be used for any other purpose than to provide health healthcare services. So that's another thing regulators expect you to ask. Um, data incident notification. We'll talk about, about that a little bit later, but you know, heaven forbid there's a data incident, um, you need to know if it's going to happen or not because you may have your own compliance obligations with respect to that. Regulators want to make sure you know that as well. Data deletion. How do you know that if once you've deleted data from the cloud, it's actually gone? Regulators want you to know. We provide an obligation on ourselves, a contractual commitment to purge the data that you've deleted, so you know that. Data portability. What happens if you want to take your data and move to a different provider? Regulators want to know, can you take the data with you? And so you want to look into the capabilities that we do provide for data portability. What type of data will be stored? The type of data is also very important with regards to whether or not it is regulated by a regulator. For example, European privacy law applies to personal data. Um, educational records apply to educational data, of course. Um, so not all requirements uh, may apply to, to all the data you may be using the cloud for. So you want to look at the type of data you're processing to determine what regulations might apply to it. Of course, where is it stored? We've seen regulators uh, ask customers to ensure they know what data centers will be storing data or what data centers may potentially be storing the data. And then third-party audits and certifications. Is anyone verifying what we're saying is true? The one thing I should point out, and I think a lot of folks here already know this, is that there's a distinction between Google Cloud services and our consumer services. We do not serve ads on our Google Cloud products. This is not a consumer offering. This is not like Google Search, where you see ads based on your search results. There are no ads. There are special business-to-business -business terms, which I'll talk about. We have special administrator tools, because our customers are administering the services, not Google directly. And of course, we have certain enterprise services like Vault for G Suite, which lets you store offline copies of the data used for, uh, for storage discovery purposes. So we talked about compliance assessments, the things you need to look at. <clears throat> now let's focus on transparency. So, everything that you could be hearing this week, everything that I'm saying to you, could be lies. How do you know we're not lying to you? Regulators expect you to know that what we're saying to you is true. And how do you verify that? The answer is third-party audits and certifications. What that means is that we invite third-party independent auditors to come to Google and audit our data protection practices, essentially to verify our affirmations of what we do are true. So what does that mean from an operational perspective? Um, let's talk about um, SOC 2 audits. So for example, a third-party auditor will come to Google and assess each of our security controls. So we say that we do X, we do Y, we do Z. The auditor comes in pursuant to a SOC 2 audit, and they verify each one of these controls, dozens and dozens, I think hundreds of controls. And the output of that third-party auditor's assessment is a highly confidential, detailed audit report. The idea then, from a regulatory compliance perspective, as part of your due diligence, is to get this report and then compare it against your own regulatory and security and data protection needs. You compare the two, you do a delta analysis to determine if there are any gaps, and then what those gaps are. So that's, for example, a SOC 2 report. I'm not going to talk about everything, but I, I want to highlight some. Now, the SOC 2 report is, as I mentioned, where auditors come in and audit us against a certain auditing standard. But SOC 2 is not a security standard, and it's not a data protection standard. So what we decided to do a few years later, we did this in two, starting in 2012, is that we adopted ISO 27001. Now, ISO 
27001 is an IT security standard where the International Organization for Standardization creates a set of controls, they write the controls, and basically they say that if an auditor assesses you and you've achieved these controls, then you have attained this IT security standard. So the output of that is essentially a certification. It's like a diploma, if you will. So we have adopted ISO 27001. But the thing about ISO 27001 is that it's not geared towards cloud, specifically. It was drafted originally a long time ago before cloud computing had really taken hold. So what the International Organization for Standardization did is that they uh, launched specific cloud security controls, which is ISO 27017, which we've adopted, as well as specific cloud data protection and privacy controls, which is ISO 27018. And again, the auditors audit us against that standard. And if we attain that standard, which we have, then we get a certification. So as part of your due diligence, you look at the SOC 2 report. We also have a publicly available SOC 3. And by the way, the SOC 2 is NDA, but it's accessible. We have a publicly available published SOC 3. And then you look at the ISO certifications. Now, the nice thing about ISO is that it's an international organization. There are participants from virtually every country in the world, and they are the ones who write the standard themselves. Uh, in other words, every country has an opportunity to create this global standard. And the reason why it's important from a compliance perspective is that because it's an international standard, it makes it more readily or easily adoptable by customers across the world, and it also makes it easier for regulatory authorities to recognize the importance of and the validity of these standards and certifications. You'll also see sector-specific um, areas such as PCI DSS, which we uh, attain for uh, processing payments for some of our cloud services, um, Privacy Shield, which is something related to European law, which we'll talk about in a minute, FedRAMP for U.S. government, MTCS, which is, uh, which is uh, helpful for financial services, particularly uh, banks in Singapore. So we'll talk more about various frameworks. This is why certifications are so important. As a matter of fact, I can think of a story. There was a, an educational uh, institution in Northern Europe a few years ago um, that were, they were using G Suite for education, and their regulator sent them a letter and said, how do you know that Google is not using the student data for serving ads? How do you actually know as the customer? So the customer went through the ISO controls, they went through the SOC 2, and they found that their was a specific control in ISO 27018 that we're audited against that says data will not be used for ads without permission, without disclosure. There's a limitation on how data could be processed. Remember I mentioned that earlier? And they were able to respond to the regulatory inquiry citing the certification that we have in ISO 27018 and the controls that are part of that certification. And you can get the controls directly from ISO, by the way. And this is an example of some of the control, of some of the objectives and some of the controls that are reviewed as part of this audit. I'm not going to go through every one. We don't have enough time. But you know, some examples, information security, uh, purpose and scope of processing. Remember I talked about how regulators want to make sure that processing is limited? This is where that would be covered. Um, data minimization, collection limitations, not collecting or more, using more data than is otherwise required to provide the services. Um, communication security. Uh, business continuity, um, cryptography, access controls, a lot of very important, interesting areas that you might want to take a look at. In addition to, again, as I mentioned, the due diligence that regulators expect you con to conduct, there are also online resources that are available. We create white papers periodically to help you in your assessment of our services. Um, I'm going to talk about it in a little while, but we have recently launched a GDPR resource center that helps you assess uh, our services with respect to the European uh, General Data Protection Regulation. We have uh, white papers information about our data centers, uh, security and compliance, encryption. This is great because you have an opportunity to review these, and then when your regula regulator asks, have you done your due diligence, you can say, I've looked at these white papers, I've looked at this collateral, I've looked at the SOC 2 report, I've looked at the ISO certification. I obtained the controls from ISO and have reviewed those, compared them against our requirements, and there's a lineup and they match. 
Another interesting aspect is data centers. Regulators have often asked, do you know where the data is being stored? Now, some regulatory frameworks um, specifically require, require you to know where data is located. And some of our services actually within Google Cloud allow you to locate data in specific areas, a copy of data in specific areas. But uh, they may ask, for example, uh, why has Google chosen to put data centers in particular regions? Um, so let's talk about that for a minute. Um, we choose to place data centers in certain regions, as people might imagine, for bandwidth uh, reasons, for cost, for energy savings. But then, of course, there are policy and rule of law considerations. We won't build a data center in any location where there is not a rule of law, where there's no stable government. Um, we want to make sure that there are protections against uh, content, uh, copyright, or trademark concerns for provider. And we can only build data centers and will only build data centers where we are allowed to do so as a US-based company. You won't see uh, data centers in OFAC-restricted countries, for example. So we've talked about the importance of conducting compliance assessments for your, for your sector, with your counsel, your compliance professionals, the importance of transparency, making sure you conduct your due diligence and the information we can provide to you to help with that. Now let's talk about contracts. Now, third-party audits are terrific. They verify what we're saying is true, but it doesn't mean anything unless it's put in writing. And we have seen situations where financial regulators have asked our customers for copies of their cloud contracts with their cloud provider to verify that, that they reflect the regulatory needs of that particular industry. We've seen financial services regulators do this more than once. So let's, do a brief, let's have a brief overview of what we provide from a contractual perspective. Because again, these obligations need to be in writing. So first we have the customer agreement. This includes commercial terms, um, billing and payments, how much it's going to cost, um, whether there's going to be, what type of te technical support there's going to be, um, who owns the intellectual property. And as I mentioned, you own the data that you upload into Google Cloud. Those cover the general commercial terms. But then we also have something, and I'm going to focus on this in the next slide particularly, we have something called data processing terms. This is a special part of the contract that sets forth the data protection obligations that we have with respect to the protection of our Google Cloud customers' data. This is something that we actually did not have originally. We had this incorporated into our earlier contracts, but having a special section, a special amendment for data protection, is something that we implemented in 2012 based actually on guidance from data protection regulators in Europe. This includes things like the privacy commitments. Remember that data use restriction? We won't use your data for ads or for any other purpose than per your instruction or provide the services. That's where it is. It's in the data processing amendment. Um, a commitment to maintain third-party audits, right? We want to keep doing this and be able to provide you with these certifications. An obligation to delete the data, for example. I'll go into more detail of the data processing terms in the next slide, as I mentioned. But also, a cloud contract isn't necessarily appropriate for every country, for every vertical. So for certain verticals, for certain countries, for certain areas, we have special industry-specific terms, special amendments that would be appropriate for that particular region. Uh, for example, financial services. Uh, regulatory authorities have special requirements and expect their banks, their securities firms, to be able to have terms that address those requirements. Uh, business associates agreements, which is important for HIPAA, uh, that is U.S., um, U.S.-based protection of, of, of patient records. Uh, as I mentioned, financial services terms, EU model clauses, which is used to ex or transfer personal data from Europe to the rest of the world, and FedRAMP, which is for U.S. government data. So let's talk about the data processing terms, which I mentioned earlier. They are the data protection obligations that we provide, and from a regulatory compliance perspective, this is something that's going to be particularly important when it comes to working with regulatory authorities. It is essentially the privacy policy for Google Cloud contracts. And it was something that, as I mentioned, we initially launched in 2012, but it's been evolving over the years. It's not a static document. We are continually getting feedback from regulatory authorities, uh, particularly in Europe and in regulated markets like financial services, and then we're updating it over the years to reflect latest requirements. 
As a matter of fact, it was most recently updated um, for GDPR. We did this in 2017 to be ready for when GDPR takes or took effect in May 2018. And incidentally, if you are existing Google Cloud customers, you want to make sure that uh, you opt in and use the latest uh, data processing terms for GDPR. But let's talk about some of the areas within, within GDPR, or specifically within the data processing terms. Excuse me. Um, this is where we include the limitation on processing, as I mentioned before. We won't use the data for any other purpose than to provide the services. There are no ads. Um, data deletion. This is where we include the obligation that when you delete data, it will be purged within a specific period of time. It's not going to just sit there forever. And I would, I would venture that this is better than what a lot of people do on-prem. Um, this is where we include the obligation to maintain these third-party audits and certifications. Because after all, what's the point if, as soon as you sign up, we no longer do it? So this is why here we include an obligation to constantly and continually do it throughout the entire term of your contract. Um, subprocessors, we haven't talked about this before. What if Google uses vendors or third parties? The regulatory authorities that you work with will want to know, is Google using any vendors? Are they sharing data with anyone? Well, from a Google perspective, um, we do the vast majority of processing ourselves, of course, because we're Google, but we do have some vendors. And so here we include an obligation to make sure that we let you know who those vendors are, we provide you with notice in case we decide to use a new vendor, that they uh, comply with certain very stringent security requirements. And the vendors we use, even though we do the vast majority of processing, generally would be things like technical support, providing 24-7 uh, customer service, 24-hour uh, uh, access, different language support. So they are there, and this is where you can find them an obligation to protect your data, the security measures that we'll use. Um, remember I told you about data incident notification? That's something else that's critical. Um, I hope it never happens, but let's say that there's a data incident that affects your data. There's a breach, for example. Many regulatory authorities um, demand that you have obligations to your own customers, to your own users, if there is a breach. But how can you fulfill that obligation if your cloud provider doesn't tell you if it happens to them? So we include an obligation, and we've actually been doing this for many years, probably from the first days of Google Cloud G Suite, where we provide you with notification if there's an incident that affects your data. And of course, um, the other thing is that we make available a data privacy officer that folks can contact if they have any questions that affect uh, European privacy, for example. So that's why data processing terms are so important. So we've talked about compliance assessments. We've talked about transparency, contracts, and now let's talk a little bit about regulatory frameworks. Um, I want to touch upon finance, because financial services is a very big deal. There's been a huge adoption uh, by banks of cloud services. So let's talk a little bit about what regulators in the financial services space have been asking questions about in our experience. So as I mentioned, all the areas we discussed regarding the due diligence questions at the beginning, you know, who owns the data, where is it stored, per, uh, processing limitations. But then regulators uh, in the financial services space also maintain very strict oversight over their banks. Obviously, it's a highly, highly regulated industry. So regulatory authorities want to make sure that when a financial services customer moves all of their data into the cloud, that the regulator still maintains the ability to exercise oversight over that data. Financial services regulators expect that a bank will be able to subject themselves to an audit by the regulatory authority at the regulator's choosing. And they want to make sure that if the cloud customer moves their data to the cloud, they can do so. So in our financial services terms, we include language that says, we acknowledge you, customer, as the bank, are regulated by your regulatory authority, and that um, and that you will, as such, pursuant to your obligations, make that data available to the regulator if they request an audit from you and that they still have jurisdiction. Regulators want to see that type of language so, with the customer so that customers can verify to the regulators that they can still be subjected to audits, for example. But it goes beyond that. Some regulatory authorities in the financial services space want to be able to regulate us or audit us directly as the provider. 
So we've had to address that and agree to these sort of requirements for certain jurisdictions. Same thing with customers. Um, in many different markets, customers are expected to be able to conduct audits directly over Google. And we agree to this in many jurisdictions. Now, naturally, we much prefer the use of third-party audit uh, reports and certifications because it's much, much more scalable. But in situations where that is an issue, we still agree to it because that's what many financial services regulators have expected of us. Um, another area that uh, we address, so that's financial services. Another area that, uh, that we look at and we provide services for would be healthcare in the US, for example. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, you've heard me mention HIPAA. We do provide services to entities that are regulated by HIPAA, that are covered by HIPAA. HIPAA involves protection of uh, protected health information. And to address this, for example, we offer what's called business associates agreements. You remember when I was talking about contracts where we had three different slides where we talked about the main commercial contract, the data processing terms, and sector-specific terms, the business associates agreement would be a great example of sector-specific terms. We also have special implementation guides, like the HIPAA implementation guide, where you can review it and determine how best to deploy Google Cloud services when it comes to protection of data. This is, again, white paper resources that I mentioned earlier. In providing services to the educational market, um, FERPA, for example, is uh, data that involves student records that must be protected. So we have special language that addresses that in the education space. And then there are other markets like uh, government. For example, in the U.S., as I mentioned, you heard me mention FedRAMP, author the FedRAMP authorization, authorization to um, operate. We're at, uh, we're at moderate level, and that means government agencies, certain government agencies can store their data in Google Cloud. Um, United Kingdom. The NCSC and the participation in the G Cloud Marketplace to help government entities in the United Kingdom use Google Cloud. And again, um, you mentioned, you heard me mention that ISO certification is helpful globally in the vast majority of markets. In many cases, a lot of these programs are related to ISO, and uh, we can expect that in some governments they have special uh, requirements such as FedRAMP. Just an example of some of the financial services companies that have adopted Google Cloud over the years. Um, the, again, these are highly regulated, yet we have been able to create an offering which helps the customers address their regulatory compliance needs in the cloud. So we've been very successful in being able to do this. It's a lot of work, but again, this is a, a developing area and very exciting. Now, I can't talk about regulatory frameworks without talking about European privacy. So let's talk a little bit about that. Now, this involves the protection of personal data of European, of European citizens, European users. So let's start from the, at least from the beginning of, of my discussion. This really started, as far as we're involved, with the European Data Protection Directive of 1995. This implemented very strict privacy controls over personal data of Europeans. And this basically uh, set the stage for what Google Cloud and a lot of our cloud provider peers would focus on when creating our services, particularly when it comes to business-to-business -business services. One very important restriction of, of the EU Data Protection Directive of 1995 was that it limited the export or the transfer of personal data from Europe to any other country in the world that was not considered to have adequate privacy protections as determined by Europe. Now, to help address this <coughs> data transfer issue, and you have to remember when the Data Protection Directive was passed, uh, the internet wasn't really being used for commerce, right? There's a huge shift. So Safe Harbor was passed in 2000 that would allow the transfer of personal data to the US. How many people know now that Safe Harbor was invalidated? There we go. So, and then in 2012, because many countries were concerned that they couldn't receive personal data, the European uh, Commission launched model clauses. And what that is, is these are special contractual terms where if you enter into these with your cloud provider, data could be transferred anywhere in the world, assuming that both the customer and the cloud provider comply with the requirements. And then, later in 2016, the EU and the US created Privacy Shield which is, again, another framework that replaces Safe Harbor 
to allow the transfer of personal data to the United States. So the net net of this is that even though the European privacy legislation limits the transfer of personal data from Europe, there are regulatory frameworks that Google has adopted, privacy shield and model clauses that allow data to flow through our global infrastructure of data centers. Now let's turn to what's most important to a lot of people, the recently passed general data, or the recently enacted general data protection regulation, GDPR, which replaces the 1995 directive. The GDPR, of course, is extremely significant. It's the most important piece of legislation since the 1995 directive. And the idea is that it's a regulation. It's not a directive. What's the difference? The directive from 1995 um, basically directed member states in Europe to pass their own laws that reflected the requirements of the directive. The result was similar laws, but somewhat of a patchwork, which made compliance challenging for providers and customers alike. So this is a regulation. It has direct force of effect of law, presumably to help reduce the likelihood of, of inconsistent enforcement or inconsistent laws. And it strengthens the rights of individuals. So what does that mean as far as what the general data protection regulation requires? You'll see a lot of things here look, look uh, familiar to what we've talked about before. So the core principles of processing remain the same as what the data protection directive had. Purposeful limitation. Data will only be used and processed based on instructions from customers and for a particular purpose. Um, commitments on data deletion. So when data is deleted, it's actually deleted. Um, security commitments. International data transfers. You remember you heard me talk about privacy shield and model clauses is very important to allow the flow of data around the world those data transfer mechanisms are still recognized and valid under GDPR. It's very important. Um, there are stricter obligations for data processors. I should mention that customers under the European model are typically data controllers. They decide how the data is processed. And Google Cloud, as the cloud provider, is the data processor. We follow the instructions of our customers only when it comes to the processing of data. So there are new stricter obligations in GDPR than there were in the Data Protection Directive. And this is based on, uh, actually, in a lot of guidance the data protection regulators have issued over the years. That guidance was, in turn, incorporated into GDPR. But we've been doing it for many years. So it's not new for us. You remember incident notification, where we indicated that we provide a commitment to let you know if there's a data incident? That's now part of GDPR. We've been doing it for many, many years, but it's now a requirement. Data return. There's now a requirement in GDPR that there's a data portability um, capability, which, as I mentioned to you, we have as part of our services and in our contracts. Um, there's an obligation that data protection regulators and customers have an audit right, which we've also uh, maintained for many, many years now. And brand new aspects, there are greater fines. You've probably heard a lot about GDPR in the news because the fines for noncompliance can be significant, very, very high. Also, GDPR applies directly to providers like Google. It's not just the customer that's responsible for compliance, but now under GDPR, the providers are responsible for compliance as well. Um, records of processing. You have to maintain uh, information about yourself and who is actually processing the data and who is responsible. And detailed contractual provisions that address GDPR requirements. You remember I mentioned earlier that we want to make sure that you, if you have already opted into uh, using Google Cloud, that you update your data processing terms to reflect GDPR commitments? This is one of the reasons. You want to make sure that the terms you have are compliant. We have that available online. You can do a Google search and opt in if, if uh, you need to. As far as where customers should start, of course, you should familiarize yourself with GDPR. You should seek counsel yourself. We are not your lawyers. This is not legal advice. Know the type of data that you're collecting. As the customer, you're a data controller, so you want to make sure that you know what you're collecting, why you're collecting it from your employees or your customers, the reasons you're collecting it, making sure you don't retain it for longer than you have to. You want to review your current controls and any gaps. You want to make sure that um, you leverage the data protection features of Google Cloud. You remember I mentioned that um, we talk about our security controls in our SOC 2 report, the white papers, um, what's available publicly online. Leverage that for GDPR compliance. And uh, of course, 
GDPR is evolving. The law has passed, but data protection authority guidance continues. And so you want to make sure you monitor any updates to uh, what this may bring in the future as regulators issue ongoing uh, advice. And finally, we have a GDPR resource center that is uh, also very important when it comes to ensuring that you uh, have conducted your due diligence when adopting Google Cloud. We talk about contracts and terms, compliance, uh, compliance analysis, and, and relevant products and services that you can leverage to help with your GDPR compliance effort. Um, so that's very important. The other thing I mentioned was regulatory engagement. It's important to stay a step ahead. So from our perspective as a cloud provider, we have worked very closely with data protection authorities, uh, financial services regulators around the world to ensure that the services that we are providing, to help ensure the services we are providing, are consistent with regulatory requirements worldwide. That may involve educating regulatory authorities about the cloud, but also uh, monitoring whether or not they are issuing guidance regarding cloud services adoption, and also being able to take feedback from the regulatory authority uh, folks and then incorporate that into our products and services, like I mentioned at the beginning of our uh, program. So let's summarize. We talked about the importance of conducting a compliance assessment in your particular field, in your vertical. We talked about the questions regulators expect you to ask. We talked about transparency, the importance of making sure you have the information you need so that you can conduct a meaningful risk assessment to address what regulators uh, want you to do. Contracts, the importance of making sure you have things in writing and have this so you can demonstrate to regulators you have the provisions you need. And finally, we talked about regulatory frameworks and the uh, latest trends we've seen, including financial services, healthcare, and GDPR. So ultimately, we'd like you to partner with us to meet your data protection and compliance needs. And we hope this presentation has been helpful for you. Thank you very much, folks.